You know, somehow X-Men 97 just keeps getting better. And with this episode, I think this might be one of Marvel's best, if not the best animated series that they've ever put out. Just take it at face value. The amount of characters that they're able to introduce to new fans and reintroduce to old fans is just mind blowing. And not only are they reintroducing these characters in great ways that make them relatable, but they're also telling a very convoluted story that is somehow understandable. This episode absolutely blew my mind for many different reasons and of course we're going to talk about those cameos. We're going to break down the episode. I'm going to give my thoughts on everything and while we do that I want you guys to leave comments down below with what you've loved so far about X-Men 97. Also there's going to be plenty of things that I gloss over so please leave descriptions and correct me if I'm wrong. Leave all of your thoughts and all of your theories for this show down below. While you're at it if you could hit like and subscribe it helps me out so much more than you ever know. I can't believe we're actually forming a community on YouTube now. I feel like it was just yesterday that I hit 100 subs and now we're on the way to 1500. So if you could hit that button it would mean so much to me. It's free. Now let's get into the breakdown. This episode starts off with Cable finally returning to the X-Men and then the X-Men explain who Bastion is. Long story short, Bastion is a fusion of Master Mold and Nimrod. So he's not human really at all. He has the physical appearance of a human and he grew up thinking he may have been human, but he is completely an AI robot who is hell bent on killing the mutants. During this explanation, Beast actually mentions Camartage, which is the place where Dr. Stephen Strange in the MCU got his mystical powers from the Ancient One. And there's actually some more MCU multiverse connections here, Beast also mentions absolute points in time, which I believe the last time we heard that was in What If? So I'm wondering if they're going to take these things such as Nexus beings, absolute points, all of them are going to kind of be the same thing and maybe even be explained in Deadpool and Wolverine. But nonetheless, this is just so cool because we're starting to see a little bit of connectedness to our greater MCU. One of my favorite parts of this episode is when Jean Grey is trying to wake up Rogue and we get a great monologue from Nightcrawler. He kind of lays out the whole idea of family and family is a very strong theme for this episode and honestly just the entire series. But the fact that they're able to use this family element theme so heavily in an episode that really is the first part of a three-part finale while also telling a very cohesive story in just one episode is mind-blowing. The writing for this show has put it a notch above all of the other MCU Marvel shows and I think people are starting to notice that good writing is why people love these things. Tell a good story, introduce us to characters, it doesn't matter if they're new, just make us care for them. And we get this great monologue from Nightcrawler here where he says something along the lines of, while blood is family. Family is technically the people you choose. This was so great. I loved it so much and I'm so glad Nightcrawler is getting some screen time. And this isn't the only time this episode because there is an amazing fight later on. We find out that Val Cooper has actually been working with Mr. Sinister and Bastion this whole time, but she didn't know about Genosha. You can tell she has some insane regret over this and when she sees that Magneto has the tattoo on his arm, she realizes that now he has been part of two genocides. The X-Men are desperately trying to find out how this prime sentinel of Bolivar of our Trask was created by Bastion, so the X-Men go to Bastion's childhood home. And this whole scene was very creepy. We get a lot here with Jean Grey finding out about Bastion's past, but his mom in this scene is so creepy, and there's a reason for it that I'll explain later. Meanwhile, Bastion seems to be meeting with supervillains across the whole world, and we get our first official, unofficial MCU multiverse version of Doctor Doom. This is the first time Marvel Studios has officially used Doctor Doom in a project, and it gets me very excited to eventually see him in live action one day. But maybe we're going to see him in animated stuff. Stuff first. I mean, look at all of the X-Men that are being introduced here in this show before going into live action. Needless to say, it got me very excited to see Doctor Doom for once, and we also see Baron Zemo from Captain America, Civil War, as well as Falcon and the Winter Soldier. These are just two cameos that pop up in this episode, and my favorite one and the craziest one in my opinion pops up later. Of course, we're going to talk about it. Bastion shows Val Cooper how these Prime Sentinels are made. He's essentially taking real life human beings who go along with their day thinking that they're normal humans when actually they are Prime Sentinels. And this is terrifying because then we find out how many of these are around the world. We see so many Prime Sentinels pop up. We see Roberto and Jubilee get attacked at the mall. We find out that Trish Tilby, the reporter, has actually been a Prime Sentinel all along. And of course, Bastion's own mother was turned into a Prime Sentinel. And from my understanding, they are still human until the moment of activation and then they're completely prime sentinels designed only to take out the mutants jubilee is running away from these sentinels and she jumps off a building and guess who catches her none other than roberto who is now fully sunspot i love how they took their time with sunspot i like how roberto was kind of hesitant to use his powers and he wanted to just be normal but now when the time comes he has to bring out his powers and he's officially sunspot now speaking of which they actually evade the sentinels by crashing into roberto's mom's party and it's actually very ironic because this party that she's throwing is to 
aid mutants. But when the Prime Sentinels arrive, they say that they're friends of mutants and Roberto's mom actually tells Roberto and Jubilee to go with the Prime Sentinel. Overall, the X-Men are completely losing this battle. Bastion is getting everything that he wanted and he's winning. He reminds me a lot of Ozymandias from Watchmen, thinking that he's doing the right thing by causing a bunch of terrible things to happen and he actually kind of looks like him too. We see that the X-Mansion is burning down and this is where we get the greatest fight sequence in the entire series so far with Wolverine and Nightcrawler. Since these people are now Prime Sentinels, Wolverine has no problem slicing into them, stabbing them, using his claws to the full potential, and I love this little tornado move he does. I also think it's super interesting how we get to see a first person point of view of Nightcrawler's teleportation. Meanwhile, we have the dysfunctional Summers family with Jean Grey, Scott Summers, and Cable fighting off these Prime Sentinels. They're riding around in Cyclops' Porsche, just destroying Prime Sentinels, and it's just a good time, and I feel like this is something that can only happen in animation. But prove me wrong, MCU, prove me wrong. Sinister calls Bastion to let him know that Val Cooper actually freed Magneto from his cell. And I also noticed that the X-shaped cross that Magneto was held on looks very similar to an X-shaped cross that Wolverine was on on an X-Men cover. But at this point, even though Magneto has escaped, it's fine. Bastion has won here. He got what he wanted. Even though Magneto escaped, the damage is done. We see Magneto fly up into the atmosphere while Val Cooper gives some haunting words. She says the famous line, Magneto was right. This whole episode and finale are titled Tolerance is Extinction, and this can kind of go both ways. On one hand, you have Bastion who thinks if they tolerate the mutants, humans will go extinct. And on the other hand, you have Magneto who thinks if they tolerate the humans, mutants will go extinct. I like the double-edged sword here, and I don't know if Magneto is going to be fully good after this. He's given humans plenty of chances, and Val Cooper says this isn't even shocking anymore. When all of these terrible things are happening to mutants, she's not shocked. This is just like a sense of deja vu. We see Magneto use his powers to completely encapsulate the world in a magnetic field, destroying all of the Prime Sentinels. And at this moment, we get one of the craziest cameos that made me jump out of my seat. You see this guy on the TV right here? Yeah, the 90s X-Men cartoon Spider-Man he pops up. I play the animated Spider-Man show in all of my videos and you guys know how much I love Spider-Man and the fact that they're introducing him into the X-Men 97 show gives me so much hope that they're going to reboot and do the same thing that they did with X-Men 97 with the 90s Spider-Man show. I mean, why show Spider-Man? Why show characters like Doctor Doom, Baron Zemo, Captain America? Marvel animation is in its infancy currently and I think this is just the beginning. We also get little cameos from Silver Samurai as well as a very popular X-Men character Omega Red. The power outage that Magneto causes seems to free Omega Red, so I'm not sure if he's going to appear in this season or maybe be a main character in the next one. This episode ends with Charles Xavier finally returning to Earth, but it may have been too late. He knows what he has to do now. He has to bring his family, his team together, and whether that be with or without Magneto, we don't know, but we're going to find out because he ends this episode by saying the famous line, to me, my X-Men. And gosh, like this is just part one of this three-part finale. I mean, how this series has had such great writing and such a cohesive cohesive story throughout has been mind-blowing. Considering all of the crazy elements that we have, we have robots, we have aliens, we have mutants, we have superheroes. And need I remind you, most if not all of these characters in this show have not been in the MCU yet. So the older generations who grew up with X-Men know all of these characters already, but the fact that they're able to introduce this new generation to all of these very popular characters shows us that the MCU has never been in better hands in terms of what they have planned for the future. We barely touched the X-Men in live action. We've only seen one or two just kind of hinted at. And with Deadpool and Wolverine coming out, I think the hype is just going to keep building because of how good this show is. I'm so grateful for this and I love that I get to talk to you guys about it every single week. Please leave your comments, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I will see you all very, very soon.